we are here today for a tribute to Nancy Abbey. If you can't see her shirt, it says, Activism is my rent for living on this planet. That's our theme, I think. It is. Uh, she got a lot of activism she has to do, that's why. Uh, it's not surprising that this type of tribute that Nancy wants is an educational event, and it's in collaboration. And of course, there's a purpose, and that is to, for all of us to keep inspired about our commitment to continuing this trajectory. Sometimes it's going up, sometimes it's going down toward justice, equality, inclusion, democracy, and human rights. And these are all themes that I'm going to tell a little bit of Nancy's life um, work. Um, so Nancy is not fluff, as we know. <laughs> and one of her mottos is, don't work hard, work smart. Focus on a goal or target that makes a concrete difference. And when you've got Nancy on your committee, you know you're going to get things done and make a difference. So she's taken her own advice and is today helping build the campaign for the Disclose Act to gather momentum for public banking and to work on the Prop 13 reform and there are petitions. At every good political event, there are petitions to sign in the room in the refreshment area, so don't forget to sign that one. She's also working on affordable housing in Santa Cruz, and she's inextricably linked to the PDC, sitting on the executive committee. And that does stand for People's Democratic Club, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I was thinking it was people's progressive Democrat, you know, something good. All right. On a campaign flyer um, that I just got in the mail, it had the three top donors. And looking at that, I knew I did not want to vote for that candidate, so it did help me. So we're looking forward to a lot more of that connected with the Disclose Act. So in the re recent past, Nancy co-founded the Progressive Network, and that's why all the activists in town know each other. <laughs> and we all contribute to the same events and have a collaboration. Um, then uh, she's held many positions in WILF, Women's International League of Peace and Freedom, guiding it to focus on impacting state legislative issues and also chairing the Democracy versus Corporations Committee, as well as being part of many events, tabling, building the movement. As an organizer, fundraiser, and frequent traveler with Pastors for Peace, the Cuban Caravan, and the successful <coughs> long effort to free the Cuban Five, Nancy chose to direct her attention and formidable efforts to help right a wrong levied by the US government. And this was done with the sacrifice of sleeping in like horrible conditions in Cuba, fines, getting a record, um, rough travel, etc. It's not, it was not an easy bunch of trips. And they also took the Brown Berets and constantly Nancy is trying to get the youth involved, mentoring, bringing more people in to the movement. The words of her friend and mentor, Reverend Lucius Walker, founder of Pastors for Peace, has been an underlying principle. We do this not just in defiance of our government, but in obedience to our conscience. In obedience to her conscience, in 1951, at age 16, Nancy initiated a protest of the exclusion of blacks and dirty whites from the community pool. Um, and it, it was pretty much a committee of one, and letter writing, but it started something. And thereafter, the urge and surge was unceasing. Nancy worked in many capacities in campaigns for civil rights, anti-war, anti-discrimination, anti-poverty, anti-police violence, pro-health care, just to name a few categories. And each, of course, had many events and many efforts connected with them. Nancy was a community organizer for the War on Poverty, involving renters dissent, Head Start programs, fair housing initiative, and protest of seniors' home demolition slated in order to build Campbell Civic Center. So her career was also activism, which is really the best way to do it, right? You want to get paid for your activism. And so many careers are. They are furthering justice, equality, and helping others. So she was an elementary school teacher and then the founder and administrator of the Teen Mother Program in Watsonville. 
She was also an educator and community organizer for Planned Parenthood Santa Cruz, a facilitator of parent participation in sex education curriculum development, an advocate for rational sex education. We need to work on that again. Um, <laughs> working with ETR associates. And along the way, she was also able to raise a family, which is why we are going to lose her to Hawaii. <laughs> to be with family and maybe some r and but I'm sure there's issues that you can get involved in there. <laughs> so let's give a round of applause to honor our guest. So with her on stage today is Pauline Seals. And uh, these are real short bios, I won't do another two pages. Um, Pauline worked as an engineer in the silicon chip industry, and then she retrained as a teacher, and that she got to teach physics and environmental science at PCS. She first heard about climate change and CO2 from her sons, who were attending UCSC in the early 90s, and it made a big impact. So after retiring, she joined 350.org, which was around 2012, and got involved in the fracking bans in San Benito and Monterey counties. And uh, she's been an unstoppable, as an organizer and steady hand for 350.org. And while working to save the planet we have, Pauline is educating the next generation as a docent at Natural Bridges and the Sanctuary Exploration Center, and saving some time to hike and enjoy some classical music on the side. So that's welcome, Pauline. Bruce Van Allen, he started in uh, what could be called the Watts Rebellion in 1965 while he was in high school, got him energized toward activism, and he became part of the Santa Cruz Neighborhood Organization, or ahead of it, uh, organizing the arts and crafts people to have an open market on ocean. It was called the Santa Cruz Arts Center. In the mid-70s, he started tenant organizing for rent control. <laughs> Why do we have to keep doing these things over and over again, okay? Which propelled him to uh, run for city council, and he was elected in 79, he was the mayor in 1983. Now some of his projects are restoring the river. Um, he's worked on a lot of political campaigns, including Bill Monning's, uh, local races, and currently back on rent control. And he's co-chairing uh, the campaign for sustainable transportation, and he's also an elected official again as the president of Santa Cruz County Board of Education. So let's welcome Bruce. Thank you. Zav Hirschfield is just getting started. So we have a lot more decades, hopefully, of seeing Zav around. So he's working on affordable housing, tenants' rights. He worked with the sleepouts to protest the camping ban. Um, and he was propelled to do this by seeing his friends unable to afford housing. He came here for UCSC, and people from UCSC like to stay, and they feel like they're part of the community. And seeing so many people on the streets, and especially their abuse by the city policies of the sleeping ban, etc. So let's welcome Zav. Danny also is just getting started, and he um, got going with the Santa Cruz for Bernie campaign. He worked in five states organizing, and we know how successful that movement was. It was like, who's that? And then it's like, oh, wow. Um, and right now, he's building his own organization. Well, it's going to be a collective. It's called the CLP, Collective Liberation for the People and it's organizing young folks and students around housing issues, decarceration, tuition, access to education, and um, let's welcome Danny. We're expecting um, Cynthia to come, and I have a bio of her, but let's get started with our question and answers here. Thank you, Paula. Well, thank you everybody for um, showing up today to honor Nancy with a discussion about um, being an activist or being a political organizer. And what I'd like each panelist to do, other than Nancy, is to just say something initially about what brought you to being an activist. Um, and let's start with Pauline. There's a lot of things that need fixing, but I never saw myself as an activist. I saw myself as a supporter, 
um, occasional volunteer between being teacher, parent, uh, mother of aging parents, etc. But um, the 350 group here drew me in. So, um, my introduction to political activism was my family. Um, I have an early memory of being taken with my father to an enormous march in downtown Los Angeles against the invasion of Iraq. Um, and we all know how effective that was. Um, but uh, that was kind of my start. My father has always been very political. Um, I was active with anti-tuition hike demonstrations on campus in 2013 here. Um, and just see politics as an integral part of life. So, hope to continue. Danny. Um, I got started on the Birdie campaign uh, January 2016, never organized before, and I was going through a hard time, and I very impulsively bought a plane ticket to Iowa, and jumped on the plane, and learned how to canvas, and just fell in love with all of it pretty quickly. <laughs> Well, um, as Paula related, I was in high school when the insurrection at Watts happened, and um, if anybody remembers that time, it was a classic thing that is so familiar, which is somebody being pulled over by the police for some traffic violation. They get out of the car, the police are roughing them up, a crowd gathers, and suddenly shots are fired, and the person is on the ground, and people are angry. And this was in a period when there had been police brutality um, in the news pretty much constantly for a number of years leading up to August of 65 um, in South Central LA, and which is the predominantly African American section of LA at the time. And um, in my middle class high school, we could look across town and see the flames and the smoke rising from, the, from South Central and Watts. And um, we knew we were affected. And my own personal thing, uh, um, happened when we were watching the news on TV and at one point flipping the channel from seeing the National Guard <laughs> shooting at people, including students I knew in Watts from, from high school track meets, um, uh, and then turn the channel and there's the U.S. Army shooting Vietnamese in 65. I could not take that as a 15 year old and fortunately my mother, who is a Wilf member, um, uh, helped give me some perspective. And I learned from there that you have to take action when you find things wrong. And uh, I'm afraid I haven't been able to stop since then. So <laughs> um, now, Nancy, I would like you to just to say whatever you want to say. It doesn't have to be about how you came to be an activist, but you could start there if you want. Well, I suppose I became an activist because my parents were socialists during the time of the McCarthy era. and. Um, we subscribed to the Red Star and read the Progressive. And then in high school, my teacher in social studies would talk about how terrible Russia was and how awful communism was. Of course, at that time, I was pretty naive about what Stalin was doing. But I used to get up in class and say, workers of the world, unite!" <laughs> and my classmates just rolled their eyes. So, um, <laughs> One of the things that Paula mentioned was my working for the poverty program in San Jose. And I think my proudest moment in organizing, and I, there's a distinction we may talk about between organizing and activism, was when we got seniors who had never been activists before to march on City Hall because that city was going to tear down this whole neighborhood where they were living. And we were successful. The city council decided that they could wait for six months and they set up an agency that helped these people find a place to live. And after my fiasco of a 1950 <laughs> trying to integrate the swimming pool, that was a really wonderful thing to do. Thank you. So, um, actually, I would like to touch on the thing that the little topic that you mentioned, which is that <clears throat> for times in life I felt I was someone who would show up, and showing up is important in politics. Um, 
And, but I was there as myself and just as an individual, part of a crowd, maybe at a rally or a, a march or something like that. And um, that was one way that I found to take, a part, take part in things. But I found as I did more political activity that I came in touch with people who had been lifetime organizers. And I, it made me wonder, what exactly is an organizer? And I was fortunate to have, um, welcome, Cynthia. Um, we'll come back and introduce you in a second. Thank you. Um, uh, fortunate to have learned from some people who learned from the best. And some of you may know the name of Fred Ross, or Fred Ross Jr., his son. Um, they have helped develop approaches to organizing in communities and in labor situations and others that um, define the role of the organizer as different from the role of the activist. And the organizer is the one who takes on the idea of that collective action is the way to bring change and that the way to have people get together and, and be capable of working together <clears throat> is a matter of motivation based on what their own life is giving them in their experience. And so that you don't go out and tell people what to do as an organizer. You go out and ask them what they think should be done. And then you find the common ground and build from there. And so for some of us who have chosen to take that role as an organizer, as opposed to someone who will show up or be an activist, meaning speak out, write a letter to the editor, things like that, this, this has this whole connotation of kind of this special mission, kind of like a Jedi Knight, sort of, you're like, I'm an organizer. Um, and, um, but there's a, there's a truth to it in the sense that it's a role you choose. It can be very stressful, it can be hard, um, and take long hours and lots of work and thinking, but it is a role that I now try to encourage people to think of themselves as um, having at times in their lives. So what I want to do is ask each of the panelists and Nancy um, to reflect on their own place they found themselves in in this spectrum at different times of being an activist, a show up, a, a, a follower, or an organizer, and just explore that. Um, but before we do that, um, Paula, do you, do you have an introduction for Cynthia? Cynthia, you want to just tell a few things about what you've done? Oh, okay. Well, sorry for being late. I was being interviewed by high school students that wanted to interview an activist. And, so, <laughs> and they had a lot of questions, and they were really interesting. And I'm like, uh, I, ironically, I'm supposed to be talking about being an activist at the Center for Nonviolence. So anyway, so we'll see what their story looks like. I have been involved in doing things in the community now for many, many years. I think what happened to me is that I was a student in college the year that the, our own National Guard shot four students dead on an Ohio campus at Kent State. That was my freshman year. And I think like many of us, I became a participant. But I think what really pushed me over the edge was when our schools in 2004 had the first cutback from the state of California, where, where the, the legislature and their wisdom didn't realize that the cuts that they were making at that time to, quote, balance the budget, which of course they never did, actually caused public schools to close. And the schools that were closed, over, over 200 of them in the state of California that year, were actually the schools that served our students who were the most needy. And that it was not done evenly and it was not done <clears throat> with respect or an understanding of what equal education means for all. And so I think what happens in life sometimes is that you are a person who has some skills and you don't necessarily want to use them. But a moment occurs when you have to stand up. And I think that's what happened here. And from then we started the Santa Cruz Education Foundation and, and literally raised hundreds of thousands of dollars for schools. We did the first parent-led uh, parcel tax measure B, thank you Bruce, which brought in, I think, $1.2 million a year, and it actually saved schools for uh, our students who actually were the underserved students that they were wanting to close those schools. They did, in fact, close some schools, but anyway, there's another story to that. But then what happened is we realized that your schools can only be as strong as your, as your elected officials, and so I ended up working for the school board and serving for eight years, which Bruce is also doing at the county school board. And at that time, we found out that basically we were, we were unpaid volunteers who were in charge of a $65 million budget. So really, this when you look at, in November to vote for your elected trustees, understand that's a huge and really important job. And recently, Nancy Abbey and I and a couple others um, actually put on Women's March and what I've found, based upon what Bruce is saying, is an organizer and a nonpartisan organizer is actually one of the more difficult jobs of life. Okay, so here's my, my question, and I'm going to start with Danny just because you just sure. spoke. Um, and you, you can 
get connected. Um, uh, the question is on a, some sort of a differentiation between activism, participation, um, uh, and organizing, being an organizer. What, where do you fall in that? What have you done in that? What do you think about that? And, um, yeah. um, so I definitely identify as an organizer. Um, I think I fall on that end of things. The part of organizing that I enjoy the most is building leadership, uh, mentorship, and training and investing in other leaders is my current passion. Um, and I think a lot of that stems from I spent spending a long time being sort of an activist. Somebody who shows up on the Bernie campaign, just like somebody who was told where to canvas and how to canvas, and I just did it all day, every day. And I loved it, but I started to meet organizers in doing that, and um, a few of them very intentionally invested in me and showed me that like there's you know there's more steps I could take, and I just really looked up to those people. and was like, oh, that's who I want to be. Uh, like the people that became my mentors and the people that trained me and stuff. Um, and so they put me on a very clear path to being an organizer, um, and that's where I find myself today. So I try and create those paths wherever I can, because I think a lot of it is organizing activists to move things in the community, but also like turning people into organizers constantly. Over time, I started to understand that um, political movements and political actions don't have a set way that they go, and showing up uh, and just being there, um, things are going to happen, and if you just go with the flow, then uh, what you actually want to see may not ever actually occur. Um, and you have to get involved, and you have to get your hands dirty, and you have to build relationships with people. Um, if, you, if the goals that you and your friends share are actually going to happen. So, um, like Danny, I do like encouraging people to get involved and um, develop their relationships with, with friends and other politically active people, and um, not just, uh, and be, be a body in places where it's appropriate, where your uh, input is not necessarily the one that's needed, but then when place, there are places where your input and your, uh, your critical faculties are necessary, then you should step up and, and be that person. So there's a balance, yeah. Nobody, I don't think anybody should be one or the other. Yeah, I really agree with that because I think they are two different aspects, but at the same time, activism and organizing just kind of go hand in hand, and sometimes you do it in a committee, and it's not just you out there in front. It's all the people you're working with, and I've worked, I think, on committees with most of the people in this room. And of course, it's kind of funny sitting up here looking at all the activists in the audience and talking about activism. But I, one of the things I really admire is leading from behind. And I think the Santa Cruz for Bernie campaign was a marvelous example of that. It started with some of us doing house parties. I think there were half a dozen maybe in the county. And without missing a beat, right afterwards, Jeffrey Smedberg pulled us together in the first meeting to organize for Santa Cruz for Bernie. And what I really admire was that he facilitated the meeting. He didn't run it, he facilitated it and drew people out. And by the third meeting of Santa Cruz for Bernie, he wasn't up there anymore. Other people were taking it. There were committees. There were other people taking charge. There were people running the, the collection of signatures. And I just think he's a wonderful example. And of course, he's a union-trained organizer. But I think he's a wonderful example of leading from behind and really being someone who grows more energy and more leaders. Well, I'm really a newbie here and less experienced than almost anybody, including these young men. But um, I call myself organizer because I get these 
online things to fill out and it says, will your organization support whatever it is? And it's <laughs> some real good cause and it's fine. And then I put my name and then it says, um, what is your title? And I go, oh my goodness. You see, the only title I was ever officially elected to was chair of the fracking committee. <laughs> but you see the fracking, and, and sure enough, we supported the ban on fracking in San Benito and then in Monterey. But meanwhile, all that original set of people had sort of gone off to do their thing. And there was a new group of people calling themselves Santa Cruz Climate Action Network, and there were never any elections. So I think, well, what am I going to call myself? Organizer. That's right, I'm organizing things. I can put that down. It's not dishonest. I'm not claiming anything that I didn't earn. So I guess I'm still trying to figure it out. If a person chooses activism or to take on the active role of being an organizer or anything in there, even just to show up at something that others have, have put together, um, the problems that we face today seem so immense, whether it's environmental or racial justice or changes in, in sexual politics and gender or the still long-term legacy of colonialism and imperialism around the world and things like that. And in fact, in my lifetime, I feel like as we've looked, the problems have gotten bigger right in front of us and particularly in the environmental area where 30 years ago, none of us thought we would be actively pondering the loss of polar bears, the loss of Arctic ice and all the impacts that are gonna show up because of that. The, the problem seemed to grow before us, even though it was really due to effects of long-term social um, uh, practices. Um, so if we want to engage in political work, how do we have um, this, to me, awkward word, hope? How, how do we feel that what we're doing can make a difference? Or how do we sustain ourselves when we have a defeat, which certainly all of us have experienced at times? Well, I think that's the art of organizing. If, if you are gathering together and working on a grassroots level with people who have ideas and energy and enthusiasm, one of the things that happens is it feeds you. And the energy that you send gets bounced back to you. And what you do together, and I think it sounds kind of maybe a little bit weird to say it this way, but I think what you do is you build a community family. And what happens is the family begins to work together, and as Nancy described, you might start from the beginning of the guy that's holding the mic, but pretty soon what happens is other people stand up, and they have ideas, and they have energy, and I think that, to me, I know others are saying that this is a tumultuous time, but for me, this is one of the more hopeful times that I've worked in, because so many people are being activated. And there are so many people who have said, I've never done anything before. I've always voted, but I never really came to any meetings or worked on anything or gave money. And we asked them the question, why is that? And they said, well, we just assumed it was in good hands. Yeah. And it's like, hmm, okay, well, welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and now it's not in good hands, and people know that and they feel that. And one of the more hopeful things for me is the energy from youth. And one of the things that we did this year after Women's March, which, by the way, was pretty amazing for us, too, we were like... Everyone told us the second time you'll never, you, you won't ever get close to the, the 18,000 that you had the first time. And so then we had 30 and we're like, okay, 30,000. But one of the things that we did was reach out with Gail Pellerin the day that after the Parkland shootings, um, we, we organized an event at all the high schools to do voter reg. And that particular day, we registered 602 students. And so. Adam and Pride are going to go forward with that effort in June at the Pride Parade, and I believe that that is actually, this is the key to our success. Only 8% of those kids voted in the last election. Imagine what would happen if every student really came and voted their conscience and voted their heart. To me, that is hopeful. So, I think the first place my head goes is just like, uh, Something I try to do a lot is be grounded in like the history of struggle um, and what like the the history of liberation struggles that we sit on top of, um, and knowing that like those people had hope, right? And knowing that like we need to pick up that legacy, like people like Fred Hampton cannot have died for nothing, right? Like those people, every Palestinian that struggled for for dignity, every tenant that's gone on a rent strike since rent was invented, like. 
all of those things can't be for nothing. And those people like had hope that even if they didn't change the world, like the next generation would pick it up and keep going. So I think that sometimes it's really hard to believe that we'll ever get to the things we really want, like true racial and gender justice, um, the end of capitalism. Like those things seem impossible, but like we need to be grounded in, if we don't do it, the next generation will pick it up and go from there. Um, and I think on like a more personal level, when I'm feeling really bad about it, uh, also just being, having a community that holds me, like an organizing community that holds space for that, that I can go to and share that with. And knowing that like, like we all understand the costs if we stop doing this. Um, we all understand like our stake in doing this and are very, very deeply committed to continuing to. Yeah. Trying to have a, something of a clear-eyed perspective on the state of whatever it is that you're fighting for. What can you com accomplish? Um, how much time do you have to accomplish it in? Um, like Danny said, there's a huge history that we're standing on. Um, I tend to be a little more pessimistic and think about the history of oppression, and the history of the development of capitalism and the ways it's become more vicious since its inception. And um, But also understanding from the fact that that history exists that there are literally centuries um, of human activity behind the things that we oppose or try to find alternatives for and try very hard to not take that on to myself um, because one person against 500 years of many millions of people's activity uh, is an impossible balance. So understanding that you know, as an individual you can do some things is something that keeps me from despairing. I, don't, I wouldn't say that I have hope. I don't, I don't really believe in that. I would say that I keep away from despair by understanding how much I and the people I work with really can get done. I think being realistic is very, very important. Being focused, not trying to take on everything in the world, but deciding what is really important to you and one of you said what you could really make an impact on. But also, I think just getting old has helped me. <laughs> Because I have seen, ever since my teenage years, things get better and things get worse, and things get better and things get worse. And I think we're still on an upward trajectory. To think that in my northern U.S. town, when we finally got a swimming pool, we weren't going to let the five blacks and the hundred of hillbillies, um, the dirty whites, that was what we were, dirty whites, be in our pool. Well, that doesn't happen now. I mean, there's um, racial issues are certainly still terrible, but we have made some progress. And so I think just getting old has helped me have some hope, maybe not in my life, maybe in my daughter's life, maybe in my grandkids' life, things will be much better in a lot of uh, issues. On human issues, bad as they are, I, I do think, although it's a rocky road, we are at least making progress, but the climate and environmental things, it's, it's bad, and there's times when it feels kind of hopeless, but I make a point of seeing all the things that are positive that are happening, some in this country, and a whole lot around the world. And I think about my grandchildren from here, they hear and the world they're going to inherit and I refuse to give up. I think for me it's the refusing to give up. It's the real thing in the face of injustice and, and environmental disaster. I don't completely subscribe to the idea of progress anymore. I think we could lose a lot of what we have here right now. Um, and um, a friend of mine, I was in an email exchange a few years ago and said something like, well, the system's just stacked against us and we don't really have any chance to make a difference. And I said, you know what, you can say that and you're always right. The system is stacked against working people, people of color in our system, people of, of um, racial and gender um, uh, minorities and, and a lot of other things. It's stacked against working people in particular. And um, my answer to that I discovered in trying to come to grips with that was, well, actually, you're, probably, you're always right. It is going to be always stacked against us, but 
What some of us are doing is fighting where we think it'll make a difference. And that's what animates me, is we're fighting back and we take a piece of it somewhere. For me, for a while, it was the river. That was my response to environmental degradation. Um, and, but the point is, you take a stand and you don't accept the bad stuff. Um, that's as far as I can get right now. I, I lost hope. I'm not sure about progress. I'm just fighting. So now, where this takes me is, is maybe where it takes some of the rest of the people in the audience, which is that what about ideology? You know, a lot of us, I, I, I was born right after World War II, and the world was kind of looking around going, what just happened? And, um, and there were revolutions still happening around the world, um, coming from a, 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 essentially a Marxist um, uh, perspective on who to fight for and who to fight against. And um, I've seen that. Um, the left or the, the socialist and communist movements or the, or the ideologically framed um, discussions in politics just fade and fade and fade and fade. And yet for me, um, as others have, have alluded to, isn't it pretty clear still that capitalism is actually one of the big reasons why life isn't as good as it should be for most people? Isn't it really clear that patriarchy is one of the reasons why life isn't as good as it should be for most people? And isn't it true that that imperialism and colonialism and racism hold a lot of people down still in today's world. So, given all that, where does ideology, where does an analysis come in? I remember once somebody criticized Bill Monning when he first ran for, for state office. What's his analysis? And I said, well, you know, the guy was safer shop as his attorney and um, he, he could quote Marx almost as good as Mike Rodkin in the back. Um, um, he um, uh, has shown that he's there for human rights. You know, he's a good guy, you know, and I don't need to know that he has a particular analysis, but what is that for you now? And actually, I want to start with Nancy because you have maybe the most background in having come from an analysis in, in your work, but maybe I'm wrong about that. Well, it's still that. For me, socialism is what we should be what we should have. It should be not the individual first, but the community first. And then the individual is a part of that community. I feel that in our country, forever, we have taught that the individual right is the most important thing. We teach our children that their individual right is the most important thing. I think it's really secondary. It's like we live in a family. And within a family, you try to look at what's good for the family. And if you don't, you often get in trouble. Um, but to me, that's kind of my socialist ideology. I look at something as to whether or not this is going to make the, the whole community better instead of just the individual right. So for me, that's, that's socialism. It isn't for everybody, but that's what I call socialism. Yes, I sign on to that. <laughs> um, I think it's really important to have an analysis. Um, I think that I started my life um, kind of generally liberal. I grew up in a liberal family in Los Angeles. Um, my parents voted Democrat. Uh, there was no real discussion of politics in my mom's house, my dad's house. There was no real ideological discussion. There was more conversation about like right and wrong. Um, but right and wrong on one issue doesn't give you an understanding of the world you live in. It just gives you an understanding of where you stand on that one thing. Um, and obviously no individual issue exists in a vacuum. Um, in Santa Cruz, housing is tied to transportation, is tied to wages, is tied to the environment. Uh, and so having a political analysis of the situation you're trying to affect is, is hugely important. And um, yeah, that is deciding where to go with that is a difficult one. Um, where you, how you would like to look at the world. Personally, I consider myself a libertarian socialist. Um, and that has helped me um, focus on the needs of people who are the most threatened 
in the society we live in. I identify with a lot of what uh, other folks said and a lot of what Zav just said. Um, I think most of my life I would have just identified as like a liberal progressive. Um, I now definitely identify as a socialist. Um, the people I organize with are all socialists, but I find that where analysis is really important in like contemporary organizing, like the organizing we do, is not just like, I don't think it's enough to just be anti-capitalist. Like I think you have to bring a clear analysis of race and gender into that and like understand how structural racism and structural gender oppression like grew up with capitalism and you need to be attacking all of those systems at once and never one at a time um, because otherwise we are just like gonna lose because all of those systems feed each other and because if we only talk about class or we're not talking about race and gender we are not gonna be organizing the multiracial, multi-gender movement that we need and we're gonna be erasing people. Um, and like that's not okay with me. So I think when I talk about analysis, it's less about like making sure everyone's clear on socialism, but like making sure all the socialists and all the radicals are clear on race and gender. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I also know people that like don't necessarily identify as socialists who I look up to in their politics immensely because they're really damn clear on what their values are and what they wanna move in the world and they share a vision of the world with me, even if they don't use that word. Um, and also, I am a college dropout. I cannot read theory for the life of me. I'm not proud of that. But uh, for that reason and other reasons, I don't identify with any specific theorist, uh, uh, you know, any specific strain of anti-capitalism. For me, it's more the behavior rather than the labels. And I truly believe, and I want to tell you all about a website that you might enjoy. It's called the Greater Good Science Center at, at UC Berkeley. And the work that they're doing is what I really believe in, which is it's absolutely pro-social. And what they're saying is it's capitalism and other kinds of people who made a lot of money that told us that we were competitive, we were aggressive, we were violent, we were individualist, blah, blah, blah. But the studies they've done have shown exactly the opposite. We're actually born to work together. We're actually born to work in communities. We're actually born to work in familial groups. And our strength is in networking and working together. So whatever label you want to put on that, I want it to be fair for everyone, and that's what I'm working for. And I really encourage Bruce and those of you that are feeling somewhat disenfranchised, please connect with youth, because gender, they don't care. Gender identity, whatever. They really believe in the world that should be the world that Pauline wants us to have, which is the climate is number one. We take care of the earth, we work together. There's a lot of hope out there, and I just want you to know that. I wanted to comment earlier when you said that, that um, when I do work for political campaigns, one of the things I do at the beginning of the election year is um, analyze who is the electorate this year. And um, I know some of you have heard me say this because it it was rather exciting in my view that in the last couple elections, a trend has changed that had been there, that had been happening for a few decades, which is that the, um, if you showed on a graph every voter of each age, then you'd have a histogram, you know, of different age groups and the boomer generation, which is my generation, the, the middle of the, that hump of ages is at about 64, 65 right now. Um, that's been the big bump in the, in the electorate moving through time, time going that way. Um, and, um, but then it was dropping and dropping and dropping. And for a number of, of years of elections, I, I was dismayed and, and saddened and sickened by the fact that participation in voting was dropping off. And that's not the only way to do political work by any means. It's not the only way I do it. I think it's not the only way everybody else up here does it either. But elections, some of us have found, can make a difference. And, um, the, that fall off of participation was both saddening but also kind of alarming to me when thinking about how we organize for the future. Well, starting a couple elections back, it radically changed. And so now the youngest age of voters is shooting up and their participation is shooting up. And the peak, the, the year that has the most voters in 2016 was age 22, not age 64. Not so <laughs> exactly as Cynthia said, these are people who actually have a place in their lives for, for politics and for taking on the world and including participating in the straight world politics of elections and so on. So um, to me, this is incredible um, as, a, as a new development. Um, they are a different generation. So, so let's let's 
now touch on something else, which is um, this is this is hard, but it and some I could look at this room and say, why are you bothering to talk about this? Um, but to me, it actually is central to my life and to all of our lives, which is to so say, what's the role of race today in being a political activist, and how do you position yourself in the complicated American and worldwide? work out of what this thing called, that we call race is. I firmly believe that race needs to take a very important role in our organizing. The way I showed up in regards to race was very paternalistic. I felt like white supremacy was something that was happening to other people in other communities, so I must organize on their behalf to save them, but I have no stake in ending these things. Um, and that was not, in my opinion, the right way to show up and organize in the most effective way. Um, and it wasn't truly in like solidarity with those people I wanted to organize with. Um, so since then, I've done a lot of work around my, my race and thought about my whiteness a lot, and I've gotten very angry. Um, I'm very mad about white supremacy. I am very clear that it has hurt me too. Um, and it's not about measuring, you know, that who it's hurt more. Like it's about all of us building a movement where all of us have a stake in it, right? And there's not a bunch of white people organizing on behalf of a bunch of other people. Um, and so because of that, like, I value representation a lot in the spaces I'm in and building representation into it, but also, like, I value moving white people to get really clear on this stuff, because I think we all have a ton of work to do around it. For myself, I, I can't ever separate race from class and from gender, and I think trying to do that in, in just sort of a petri dish doesn't really work, because it interplays everywhere. And so I think that, that what we have to do is do an analysis that includes every time we do race, we do class, and we do gender. That's just how it is for me. I taught in San Jose for seven years to a very mixed population. There were white and Vietnamese and Hispanic and a lot, a lot of mixed stu race students. And at times I would get to know them well enough that I'd actually ask and find out, oh yeah, this kid is one quarter Chinese and because I knew them well enough that it wasn't a loaded question. And I enjoyed that and I actually missed it a little when I came to Santa Cruz. But to me, it's just about treating human beings as human beings. <coughs> I find that a really hard thing to to talk about because I know what we're supposed to say and for me what is reality because I think and this I'm going on all over but I think for me I have been pretty much issue oriented all my life and when you look at an issue, it affects some races, some ethnicities more than others. <coughs> also, as whites, we have the uh, privilege of time to, to address some issues that people in the black community or Latinos don't have time to address because they have real basic issues. Have you ever, do you know Maslow's hierarchy? Well, that I think is very important. Or, okay, so his hierarchy, in case you haven't read about it, says that in human life, there's first, there, there are different um, levels. And the first is food, clothing, housing, and then it goes up from there, and I can't remember, it's been a long time since I looked at it, but that people at a higher stage don't have to worry so much about the food and the housing, and yet there are people in our society who do. So in a way, I feel as though I have, I don't worry about how many Blacks are in the, the campaign that I'm working on. Because I know Brenda Griffin and those people in NAACP are doing a marvelous job of attending to the issues that most concern them. For us to support that, yeah. But it doesn't mean that they have to be con as concerned about 
the environment or about some of the other issues I'm in, involved in because it's just more basic issues like the relationship to the police. So I don't know, as I say, I know that's not very popular, but that's the way I feel. Um, I do want to echo a lot of what the other speakers have said. Um, I totally agree with Danny on pushing my, my fellow white organizers to try to get clear on racial history and the history of white supremacy in the United States especially and across the globe. Um, I mean, I'm a Jew, so we've only been white for 50 years or something like that. Um, and in some parts of the country we're not, but I live, I'm from LA and that's never been an issue for me, uh, so I can't really speak to that. I um, also appreciate what Cynthia said about you know, race doesn't exist by itself. It is forever in in uh, in in conjunction with class and gender and language and nationality. Um, and I think it's easy to get bogged down in uh, representational politics in a way that can get very tokenizing if you don't consider other aspects of someone's identity, like gender and class, for example. Um, so it's tricky in that regard because in conversations about race I have with white people, there's a lot of guilt and there's a lot of fear and there's a lot of feeling like, oh, I'm not one of those people. Um, and I think that it's important to embrace the history of this country and it's important to acknowledge it and to say, you know, for the entire history of this country, um, there, has, there have been racial hierarchies for the entire history that, that people not born on this continent as indigenous people, um, there have been racial hierarchies. Um, and to sit with that and say, this is where I live, and this is a reality, and how can I work with people who are not given the same unconscious privilege in society that I am as a person with light skin, um, how can I support those people's work? How can I hear them and offer the support where I can um, and understand that I do not under I don't get the issues um, because I've never lived them um, and to respect the multiplicity of experiences that come out of uh, the many different kinds of lives that are lived in this country. Um, I think is a place that I try to come from. Um, and I also don't think, I also want to refer back to something I said earlier that there are hundreds of years of, there are hundreds of years of racial oppression in this country. And to recognize that and not get stuck in the guilt of what you as a white person are going to do in that moment to fix 500 years of racial oppression will actually make it, I think, easier to um, do things gracefully and caringly and without, uh, without so much fear. Recently I started work for the Romero Institute, which is a nonprofit devoted to um, a couple of big projects, the main one of which is defending the Lakota people, um, the water protectors um, who fought the, the Dapple Pipeline. And um, there's a big trial going on, and you'll be hearing more about this in the, in the later part of this year, where we've exposed the mercenary armies hired by the oil companies that attacked the water protectors. And Chase Ironize, who is one of their leaders and attorneys, was, is actually here in Santa Cruz this weekend. And um, uh, one of the things that came to me in thinking about where do we get with this, this struggle, with this history of, of um, colonialism, imperialism, and, and racial exploitation, um, um, and um, in a flash, I thought, well, here's something that could unify some of these pieces. <laughs> we have an economic system that has allowed an absolutely enormous concentration of wealth in very small hands. And it's, you know, as we all know, inequality is a big deal in, our, in, the, in the public discussion these days. Um, that's a huge amount of concentrated wealth. And then at the same time, where did that wealth come from? Well, it came from exploiting workers, it came from slavery, it came from stealing land from indigenous people in this continent. And so 
maybe the idea of reparations actually isn't so hard to imagine, which is we simply walk over to the banks where the concentrated wealth is held and we redistribute it to the, the descendants of slaves and they have the average working person who is almost as much a, an exploited uh, participant in our system as a black person or a Native American or a Latino, the average working person doesn't have you know, the extra savings to help with reparations, but the capitalists do. And so I think there's a, there's a platform I could uh, go somewhere on. So um, anyway, that's my thought about that. Um, what I'd like to do now is um, Move us forward. It's opening up for any of you who have um, questions of our panelists or please brief um, things you might want to say that you've been moved to think of um, during this, this conversation. But uh, before we quite get there, I want to ask Nancy if she wants to add anything else or uh, offer any additional perspective. I think we've covered the bases and we see each other's Point, the points of view are a little bit different. I do want to say that if I'm working on an issue and there isn't a black in the, in the group, it doesn't worry me because I think the issues that we are allowed by our white privilege to work on because we don't have to work on the really basic issues are important. They're not unimportant. And we're the people to do that because we have the privilege, is the word I'm seeking, but. The time, the, yeah, yeah, all of that. Marilyn. I have a question for you. You say we, as a white person, um, we do have to remember that there are poor and struggling white people. That's right. Classism in this country is largely ignored. And that has always been a really big issue for me because even within the different ethnic groups, there's classism. And it cuts across by class sometimes, I think, more than it does by ethnicity. I want to repeat what Marilyn said, is that she said that Tony Hill would remind her that she's not black and to be aware of that sensitivity. One thing that speaks to everything we've been talking about today is the millions of dollars that are in this room. Because if people were to have wills, if you own a portion of a house or a portion of a car, whatever, there are millions and millions of dollars sitting in this room that can be directed through our wills, say the NAACP or something, and just radically change what is possible for different groups. So if you haven't got that, in hand. In hand. I'd like to hear the successes that each one of you, you talked about of course the Women's March with 30,000 people coming up, but the most recent successes that you can tell us about. For me, there are a couple things that I didn't do single-handed, but being a part of it, it makes me feel really good. One was the uh, ending of the embargo on Cuba, even though, of course, <laughs> history, it's changing a little bit. But then, after years and years of that struggle, and with my friends at Davenport's and other people in the room, and Judy Gear, it was that was really very uh, satisfying. And the other was the passing of the Disclose Act. Mm -hmm. I was also very involved in that. I think it was very important that. We know where money's coming from in politics, and that passing was also really satisfying. I'm going to cheat and not answer that question. I want to say that Nancy is my role model. She is efficient, well organized, but always warm and human. She listens genuinely. She never comes across the least bit phony. Here's the agenda. If you don't fit, forget. She's she's just really terrific. Mm -hmm. 
I actually just had the gift of being able to work with Nancy on Women's March. She helped us this year. And together, working with her and her amazing networks, we pulled together 55 nonprofit organizations working in collaboration and building an effort to reach out to the public, the voting public, the donating public, the actual public who has been asleep, to understand the heroes that we have in our community every day. And that would not have happened if Nancy Abbey didn't get sit on her computer and start pulling in all the relationships, all the partnerships, all the collaborations. Within like about three days, we had about, we had almost 100% people who were, any organization that was contacted, and you know nonprofits, it takes weeks for people to get the email. People said yes, and then we thought we were full, and she, they kept contacting her, can I come, can I come, can I come? That was a Nancy Abbey. I feel bad I don't have a Nancy thing for <laughs> I can sneak it in later, though. Goodness, that was enough of that. Yeah. Um, Nancy, I mean, what, what have you done? Uh, I think, thinking about successes, there's two that come to mind. One is super recent, but I will always be most proud of being a part of the folks that elected Sandy Brown and Chris Crone. Because yeah. if there's anyone that deserves power in the world, it's people like Sandy Brown. Uh, but also, uh, the rent freeze recently was an... I mean, I remember talking about it last year, and this seemed like a far off, uh, a very far off, scary thing. Me and Bruce were arguing about it. This is like never going to happen, and it somehow materialized. And I'm really proud of all the folks that put work into that. This is a recent success and a testament to Nancy's presence in this community and people coming out for this. So just trying to tie those two together a little bit. Um, recent. Uh, specifically political success, uh, definitely getting over 10,000 signatures for rent control in this community. Um, there's a bunch of people in this room who are involved in that, um, and I think that coalescing of people is really a success as well. It's not just the, not just the outcomes, but it's the relationships that are built that are successes too, so. I got to share in a, um, regional success, the new Monterey Bay Community Power, which is one of the things that wasn't complete when they set that up um, last year was um, something a lot of us have been pushing for from the community, which is a um, citizens advisory council to also be appointed to keep them on the beam, keep them heading towards their goals for 100% renewables and for supporting local um, generation of energy and so on. And when the board got appointed with Bruce McPherson as the chair, um, we were fairly pessimistic, actually, that they would be open to a truly participatory um, citizens' advisory group. And um, again, pessimism, you know, that, no, you'll never get that. Huh? And um, so we set about organizing, um, and in all three counties, we're able to bring enough people to meetings and enough pressure to bear on those elected policy board members and enough research and homework um, to actually then be able to once again convince a bunch of people who are not leftists or liberals or progressive necessarily and who regarded a community advisory council as just trouble for them, as more disruption and things like that. We got them to appoint a very good, or to set up a very good council and the applications are in now and will be appointed in a couple of weeks and we think it's going to be a very important force for them. Pauline and I went to hear Bill McKibben last week. Pauline was tabling there, first. And Bill McKibben, who has said before, there's no time for despair, showed us a hundred slides of people all over the world in the forefront of fighting climate change. And he said, you're white in this audience, you think that you're you know, leading this thing? Not even. Mm -hmm. All over the world, there are amazing people taking action <coughs> on this. So that was so hopeful and so wonderful to put us right in perspective. And that slideshow, she's talking about Bill McKibben, the slideshow's available, correct? Yeah, the links? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You get it from the, you know, this is the alternative Nobel laureate. Oh, right. Mm -hmm. Right, so UCS grad program, you can look through Presby right. and find it online, and all the links are there, and it's just wonderful. Well, and I think we should also mentioned the wonderful local TV program that Nancy G.G. Yeah. has uh, put together. 
Matilda, who I think is here, that it has that was based on hope. That was based on looking at what is happening that can give us hope and that we can use as models. I, th I think it's just genius of her to do that. Do you, do you want to give a couple sentences just to say what it's about? Um, I would rather Nancy do. Right there. I have been so inspired today, and I want to make this my eighth show <laughs> because it was a, it has been a seven seven show series. The title of which is "The Future We Need and How to Get It," with not so much saying what we should do, but saying what we are in fact already doing all over the world, finding the best examples that I've been able to, not only of things that are hopeful and uplifting to the human spirit, but that are really compelling examples of strategic approaches to systems change that have proven themselves and that are replicable from which we can learn. They are always based on human connections, human trust, the ability to listen to each other, and all the wise lessons that you've been hearing from up here. So, the second half of each show, I take those ideas and I center in on locals who are doing that kind of work here. Thanks so much. So I just want to mention that the reason that I am here, the reason that I'm a member of WILF, that I've been participating in PDC and all of these other organizations, really comes down to one thing. Nancy. <laughs> Honest to God. I was at Occupy, so yes, I was getting involved. But Nancy kept showing up and sitting down on the steps with me in front of the courthouse and talking to me. And she finally said, you know, there's this organization, Wilk, do you know about it? And she started talking to me about it, and she just kept coming back and coming back. And finally I said, okay, I'll go check it out. And as a result, you know, I've gotten to know all of you people, and boy, there's a lot more to do, but at least I got started, thanks to Nancy. Last week I went to two clubs at Cabrillo College. I went to the Ignite, that's their own name, Ignite Group, who are feminist political people, and men were welcome there, I noticed. <laughs> and I went to the Rainbow Club there, which is more of a gender, you know, lesbian and other gender-oriented group. I want you all to know, these, these women who are coming up through these groups are very powerful and very focused. Nicholson's mother was one of the most incredible women Hilda Whitehead, she uh, was very active in the uh, anti-apartheid movement in South Africa before they moved here to the United States. Wonderful woman and a staunch Wolf member. Right? I'm just wondering if Hawaii has any idea that you're coming. <laughs> well, I want to ask one more time for some appreciation for Nancy. Yes. I'm not leaving tomorrow. <laughs> and if you see me in July, please don't say, haven't you left yet? <laughs>